Thank you very much, Millicent, and thank you all for coming. I can see this is a very popular topic. We seem to be stuffed to the, the gunnels here. I think it's really interesting and really timely because we're going to talk about the humanitarian situation in Syria, which, as we all know, is deteriorating and is extremely alarming, particularly as winter approaches. But we're also going to talk about the relationship between journalists and aid workers um, because this is... Quite com it's always complex and difficult, but in a situation like Syria, it's even more complex and, and difficult. Because journalists were trying to find out what's going on, as aid workers, they're trying to help people. And sometimes it helps them to work with us and to share information, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes, in a place like Syria, it's a matter of life or death. But who knows what? and who knows who's doing what. So it's a particularly complex and, uh, and fraught time and country. And so I think that's why we'll, we'll, I hope that by the end of the evening you'll, you'll have a better idea of what's going on in terms of the humanitarian effort and the humanitarian needs, but that also we'll have discussed some of those issues. And we are lucky because we've got a really good um, panel tonight. I'm going to go um, left to right. Fadi Haddad is from the Mosaic Initiative, um, which raises money here in the UK and uh, provides food and medicine for people in Syria. And uh, he's just back from Idlib and Homs, got back about uh, 10 days ago. Lee's Doucette will be familiar to many of you, chief correspondent for BBC World, also a presenter. Um, she's one of the journalists who's been going in and out of Damascus. She got back um, last week, and she's trying to cover the humanitarian situation, the political situation, everything that's going on in a, a, under extremely difficult circumstances. Um, Hisham Hassan is the spokesperson for the Middle East for um, the International Committee of the Red Cross. So he's there at the, at the sharp end trying to do something and make things work and get help to people, as is Ben Parker. We're very lucky that Ben is here. He just happened to be passing through London. Uh, but Ben is the uh, senior UN official for the Office of Humanitarian Affairs based in Damascus. And uh, he um, has been there, what, for six months now and uh, just came out on a, a break last week. So he's the person who has to do the really difficult work of dealing with the government and trying to help people and uh, trying to, to handle a situation where we, we often hear about the refugees and we're told that there may be up to 700,000 refugees by the end of this year. There's already 300,000. But within the country, there remain displaced people. I mean, the one statistic which stuck out um, to me today when I was reading about it was um, 1.2 million people living in public buildings. In other words, they have to have had to leave their own homes. And again, winter's coming, and we're talking about very great humanitarian needs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each speaker to uh, speak for about five minutes. And there's at least one person in the audience who I, I want to call on, because we have somebody else here who's a, a very important person in this whole constellation. Then I may ask a couple of questions, and then I'll, I'll throw it open to questions. Um, Lise, can I go to you first because maybe you can set the scene for us on what's happening and this issue of the relationship. Thank you, Lindsay. I work for the BBC, so I have to tell the truth. I arrived the last person at the meeting we were supposed to have before this, this panel. And, and because I was the last person, I arrived to find that actually they decided that I would go first. <laughs> so that is why I am going first. And so Lindsay said, well, just set out the store. And in, in my job as a journalist, I often say, thank God, I only have to write about it. I don't have to solve it. And so perhaps I'll set the scene just by saying a few stories. And Lindsay began this discussion by saying, this session seems to be really popular. But I bet everyone in this room wishes they didn't have to come to a session like this, a session about the humanitarian crisis in Syria, which deepens by the day. I work for a public broadcaster, the BBC, and even though governments don't believe that we don't take sides, maybe a lot of you in the room believe that the BBC takes sides. But I speak for myself and most of my colleagues, I'm pretty well genetically wired to try to see all sides of a conflict. 
But I think over the years, in reflecting on the kind of jobs that people like me and Lindsay have to do in, in crisis, and in fact, Lindsay and I have often discussed this, there can be no doubt that when it comes especially to war, we take the side of the people. And sadly, with ugly, terrible, bloody wars that drag on, there's a lot of people who are affected, and Syria is no different. And one of the horrible paradoxes of the Syrian conflict, and I'm sure many of you in this, in this room have reflected on this, is a country which in the Middle East had such a reputation for the sweetness of its hospitality, has had the kind of violence that has been so horrific, and the torture has been so grotesque, that has left many people, and most of all Syrians, asking what has happened to their country. And as the war goes on, we hear more and more reports about the people we say and the people who describe themselves as being stuck in the middle. Not sure if they can turn to or blame the rebels who grow in force and numbers by the day, or the government, which has, of course, overwhelming force in this conflict and therefore bears most of the responsibility. And you know, both UN envoys, Kofi Annan and Lakhdar Brahimi, have made that absolutely clear. All sides have to stop the violence but the government, most of all, has the greatest responsibility. And of all those people who are stuck in the middle, one of the other sad realities of the Syrian conflict is that most of them are, are children. And many of you in recent days may have been touched and horrified by the story of 14-year-old Malala in Pakistan in the Swat Valley, and it's been astonishing about the huge outpouring of sympathy for her because she was so young and she was so brave. But sadly, there is now a global club of teenagers, and the Syrian membership is increasing by the day. And not, none of the members ask to sign up, none of the members want to be it. But there are so many Syrian children who also have gone through the horrors. Maybe they haven't been shot like Malala has been shot, but they certainly have been targeted and terrorized, and some of them tortured. Last week, I was in Latakia, which is one of the, probably the last of the peaceful areas left in Syria, and went to a place, a, a big sports stadium for displaced people. And I met 11-year-old Mansour and his nine-year-old brother, Mohammed. And I said to Mansour, they'd come from Aleppo. And I said, well, what do you miss about Aleppo? And he says, well, I miss everything. And then I asked his nine-year-old brother, what about your friends? Did they all come with you? And he said, they've gone everywhere. I don't know where my friends have gone. And inside Syria, in places like Homs and the absolutely devastated neighborhood of Baba Amar, where sadly we've lost a lot of our colleagues, including our, our dear friend Marie Colvin, who was an outstanding member of, of the Frontline Club, meeting a little boy there, I think one of the last families still remaining there. And what you ask children about, you know, how are you? And where are your friends? Do you have any of your friends to play with? And they look you straight in the eye and they say, oh, my friends are dead. And in, in Lebanon, where the number of refugees grows by the day, I met a girl who, who I'll never forget, and we gave her the name Reem, also 11 years old, from Baba Amar. And she had seen her friend, her best friend, die in a pool of blood right before her eyes. And her house was hit as well, and a wall fell on her mother and her brother. And fortunately, they survived, but it was the last straw, and they decided to leave. And when I interviewed her, I said, you're such an amazing person, Reem. You know, you're already amazing at 11 years old. What do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, without thinking a moment, she says, I want to be a lawyer. I want to help people get out of prison. And then I went on to ask the next question. And then her thoughts caught up with me. And I said, Reem, why did you say that, you know, fine for an 11-year-old to say they want to be a lawyer, but why specifically a lawyer to get people out of prison? So I said, why did you say that? She said, my two brothers went to prison. And when they came out, they couldn't walk. And I thought, an 11-year-old girl shouldn't have to see that kind, of, that kind of terror in her own life. And yet she was remarkably brave and so full of courage and with hope for her own future. But sadly, many mothers and fathers, as anyone's mother and father would do, are deciding their they don't want their children to see this. And I met Mansour and Mohammed's mother in Aleppo, and she said Aleppo is a disaster area. There are bodies lying in the street, houses are destroyed. We didn't want our children to see that. And so therefore, humanitarian crisis inside the country and a growing humanitarian crisis outside. And all of the neighbors of, of Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, and Lebanon are taking in an ever-growing number of refugees fleeing across the border. And the last time I looked at the numbers, 50% are children. 
And if you add the mothers, 75% of the refugees are women and children because the men are staying behind. And what do you do when you go into these countries? You have waves and waves of people. I was in Jordan in July for the opening of the first official refugee camp, the Zatari camp. It was hot, it was windy, it was dusty. And even Andrew Harper, who heads the UNHCR there, announced, he said, nobody would choose to live here. And I heard him saying that, and I thought, did the head of the UNHCR in Jordan say that nobody wants to come here? And I, in fact, I went back and listened to the interview three times because I thought, how could he admit that? But how could you not admit that? I mean, no one in this room would want to live in those kind of circumstances because many of the people who are fleeing are people like you and I. We're used to living in a house with a roof. And we were astonished to meet many people who were living in transit camps and were being told they had to go to Zatari, telling us they preferred to go back and die in Syria because they didn't want to live in those circumstances. But when I was in Zatari, there was nobody there. And now there are tens of thousands of people. And they have room for more than 100,000. And I think why the neighboring countries are so worried is that this is a long-term crisis. All of us in this room would wish that the war would end tomorrow. We wish it had ended yesterday. But this is going to be a long term. And look at Jordan, where the Iraqi refugees are still there. The Palestinians are still there. And so what are these people going to do in the long run? Because not only are people dying every day, the saddest thing of all is Syria as a country is dying, the Syria that we knew of, of before. When I was in Latakia, it was amazing to see there was still that sense of a country, a secular mosaic, a peaceful place, you know, jet skis on the Mediterranean, and young people talking about their hope and hoping, perhaps against hope, that the war would not come to their town. But sadly, that's what they said about Aleppo, and that's what they said about Damascus. So this humanitarian, this political crisis, this bloody war is going to be with us for a long time, which will then take us to the issue that Lindsay began by saying, then, then it's the, the challenge for all the aid agencies to keep all of us interested and concerned and compassionate about the story and to make sure it doesn't go off the front pages or, or out of the headlines. But it's going to be very difficult, but most difficult of all, I think, is going to be for the Syrian people. Thank you, Liz. Um, before I head over to Ben, there's uh, some seats near the front which aren't taken. So if there's anybody at the back who would like to come up to sit on a comfortable seat instead of standing. There, I can see one there. Is there one or two there? Yeah, there's a couple there. Go in there. Okay. One in the second row here. <coughs> okay, there's one more in the second row. Does anybody want to come and take it? No? Nope? All right. Um, thank you very much, Lise, for, for painting us that, that rather upsetting and depressing but realistic picture. Ben, you're the person who has to try and do what you can and mobilize the resources to do what you can to alleviate some of this suffering. Um, give us something of an idea of how you go about that and, and, and what the situation is. Okay, thank you. Um, I think starting, I need to start by saying I work for the UN and my job is to um, try and help open up the humanitarian access and the operations so that more people can receive help. And uh, to do so, I engage uh, with my colleagues with the, with the government uh, on a very, very, very regular basis. And therefore, you'll forgive me for speaking uh, with some circumspection uh, in a public forum. When I started the job, I was plucked off of another thing and uh, taken to Geneva and met the permanent representative of, of uh, the Syrian Arab Republic to the UN in Geneva. And he, uh, he, told, he told a story. He said, I hope you're uh, going to work uh, in a way that we can deal with. We need you to come through the door, not through the window. <laughs> <coughs> and um, the, uh, my side of the, the experience of, of trying to help uh, the Syrian civilians is, is definitely the, that one of going through the front door, not through the window. And um, I think maybe there, there, there's a lot of uh, other things going on uh, on, on other channels. 
to take it back to maybe February, the government of Syria denied there was a humanitarian crisis, denied a visa to the most senior UN humanitarian official to visit, uh, claimed that all talk of humanitarian need was um, simply politicization, and um, that humanitarian needs were being fabricated and uh, fantasized with by the media and by hostile powers in order to, uh, I think in their view, <coughs> part of a, a program to, to reduce the legitimacy of the state and the, and the government. And that uh, at that point, there was not a recognition of need, nor was there a recognition that international help would be either relevant or, or necessary. Um, so since then, we've, uh, we've taken this um, wall and tried to find a few cracks in it. And um, our, our results are limited. But um, I think in terms of where we've got to today, there's been, there's been a big change. Um, uh, in March, we were permitted, and I led a, a, an assessment on throughout the country, including the UN and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. At that time, we felt that was a potential um, partner that would be attractive to the, to the government and neutral in its own way. Um, we were allowed to cross into the rebel-held, uh, opposition-held parts of Homs, of Deir Zor, of uh, Idlib, and, uh, and other parts of the country. Um, we had a very, very complicated uh, time. We were accompanied by many minders, many officials, uh, heavy security now and then. We used priests and go-betweens and thuraias and activists to cross the lines. And, uh, and it was um, very tense and a very unfamiliar experience for the government of Syria to have a large group of international people sniffing around, asking questions, taking notes, and so on. And we were very thoroughly observed in that work. And uh, many notes were taken about our notes, as you could imagine. Um, at that point, they did not uh, allow international NGOs to work to help Syrians. After much negotiation, they have now allowed uh, eight uh, international NGOs to work. They did not allow the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to help Syrians, only to help uh, Iraqi and other refugees. They did not want any attention onto the, uh, the needs of Palestine refugees, whose own uh, livelihoods are suffering as a result of the conflict in Syria. They didn't want us to engage with anybody other than the Red Crescent, and, uh, and that's also a change. We are now working with 40 or 60 local charities and, and uh, non-governmental organizations. They didn't want us to be in the field, uh, have any presence outside of Damascus, and that now is uh, slowly changing. So in terms of our humanitarian space, uh, as we call it in the jargon, the access is still extremely limited. But it's come quite a distance in, in the last six months. We work in many countries where the state doesn't feel comfortable being labeled as needing humanitarian aid. You think of Burma, you think of Eritrea, you think of um, uh, Ethiopia, for that matter, uh, uh, and Sri Lanka. Um, it's not that rare for a state to be uh, suspicious and uh, lack confidence in the sincerity of an international aid effort. And, and Syria is that. Uh, taken to a new, I think, uh, a new and very uh, difficult degree. Our, our purpose is to help the people, and the needs are, uh, the needs, as, as, as Lindsay mentioned, is people living outside of their homes in unsuitable places, often without enough uh, sanitation and toilets and clean water and food and, and, and soon warmth. Um, also, the, the, probably the thing that's killing the most people is, is traumatic uh, physical injuries. You're not getting your wounds treated. Uh, those that are treated are treated by amateurs. You don't necessarily trust the public health facilities that are, are still open. And your uh, ability to do follow-up care and prevent infection is, is very limited. But there's also probably another wave coming of need. And that's to do with uh, people with long-term medical problems. There's a lot of diabetes, uh, blood pressure, cancer these kind of diseases where um, the supply of medicine is drying up or people don't have the money to buy them. And uh, I think uh, in the winter, we'll see <coughs> an, uh, some other public health issues. At the moment, we're seeing just the sort of beginnings. You see a lot of lice, a lot of scabies in the children among the displaced people. We have only fragmentary data because we are prevented from doing systematic surveys. Pulling out a, 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 a clipboard in Syria is a guaranteed way to end your day in an unhappy manner. 
Uh, my colleagues from, from another aid organization said you should always hire people with good memories. <laughs> so you can <laughs> ask the questions, but write it down later. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, not unusual for you know, cameras, notebooks, these sort of things to be uh, uh, of extreme interest to, to the security apparatus. But you can have my notebook. It says toilets, it says mm -hmm. jerry cans, it says tarpaulins. But you know, uh, there's certainly a suspicion that the entire humanitarian enterprise is a Trojan horse for military intervention. It's like the gateway drug. You know, if you can say that the country cannot meet the needs of its people, is preventing the internationals from working, is denying and uh, obstructing the aid effort, the thinking, I think, in, in Syria and in other governments is that uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a pretext for intervention and other action. So um, that's the political mindset that, that, that we have to tackle all the time. Um, we have numerous uh, exhausting restrictions on how we move, who gets a visa, how many pieces of paper you have to have to do a field trip of two days to Homs. Um, within each uh, field trip, you, who you're accompanied with and where you have to go is, 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 a, is, is a lengthy uh, and exhausting negotiation. We also negotiate language um, with, with the state. Uh, the, word, the word for displaced people, Nazahin, is really problematic for the uh, government of Syria. It, for them, it, I believe, it conjures up a, a, a Darfurification of the country, with an invasion of NGOs and begging bowls and queues in the desert. And um, the, the approved uh, euphemism this month, I think, is uh, moving people. <laughs> and uh, the word crisis was not welcome. The word uh, humanitarian need was not welcome. Um, <clears throat> and in the end, um, if you see from the state news agency, one of its tweets the last couple of days was, uh, people affected by current events. So current, current events is an acceptable uh, uh, terminology. Yeah. Now, in response to this, we've taken a very narrow yes. definition of what is humanitarian. The UN has a political track, which is failing, clearly. Uh, the member states are failing to agree. It has a human rights track with a commission of inquiry based in Geneva. It's making its own uh, findings and gathering evidence for potential uh, future action legally. And we take in the humanitarian track as a very narrow definition of humanitarian. We don't care, I said to the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, we don't care what happened to the clinic and who did it, but we'd like to fix the clinic. We don't need to be told that the so-called terrorists have done this or the so-called uh, foreign uh, governments have undermined this or that. So we're taking a rather a purist and, and almost, uh, you could argue, a simplistic definition of humanitarian. We are interested in the blankets and the toilets and the jerry cans and the medicine, not who's to blame and how did it get like that. And uh, the UN is a, is a many-headed beast, and, and in a sense we do we can say truthfully that other parts of the, uh, of the institution are chasing those other issues. Um, I think also it's, it's a struggle, as, as Lee said, for a state that was in fact so advanced in, and has such a rich uh, history and an and extremely well-developed state, welfare state uh, provision of uh, 93% of the medicine in Syria was manufactured in Syria. There's only a few types of drugs that couldn't be made there, like HIV drugs, like uh, immunosuppressants for transplants and things like that. Um, people had uh, cars and electricity all the time and uh, an enormous range of, of subsidies and, and public services. So um, it's even those who I think are not supporters of the state are uncomfortable with the humanitarian engine that threatens to come in. It doesn't feel right to them as Syrians. I, correct me if I'm wrong, that to have the kind of aid business coming in, and, and, and it's, it's a further depressing reflection on the state of your own country to imagine you need <coughs> NGO people running around. Finally, I'll go to now to the, um, the media thing. I've never in my career spoken less to journalists. <laughs> I've been a journalist, uh, and, and I've, I've uh, interviewed <laughs> many aid workers and squeezed them myself, um, it's, it's a very unusual situation. Normally, aid agencies want to talk to the media for three main reasons. One, money, cash. Two, to make sure that the attention doesn't go away. You know, we call it raising awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and thirdly, we also, another awkward word, advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, advocacy in the sense that you want 
people with power to take a certain course of action. Now, in Syria, none of these three really work because in terms of the course of action, nobody has the answer. Kofi Annan doesn't have the answer. Hillary Clinton doesn't have the answer. And certainly the press officer of NGO XYZ doesn't have the answer. So what is the course of action that is requested? Stop the violence? OK. Uh, in terms of raising awareness, it's top of the news already. We all feel impotent and frustrated and infuriated and disgusted. So is there more, is there a lack of awareness? And on the cash, the cash, raising the money is very difficult because the, the donors have a, have a tricky attitude to, to uh, the problems of Syria. They, f they fear a lot of uh, government interference. Uh, often um, they assume interference in the absence of evidence to the contrary. Uh, they are unwilling to um, you know, make excessive compromises given the state of the, uh, of the regime and, and, and the human rights um, context. So the money. Um, the money issue is, is, is a, not a simple fundraising uh, action. So in that sense, the, uh, we're heading into sort of unknown territory, I think. Also, uh, NGOs and the UN tend to <coughs> like to speak on behalf of those in need. But I think the Syrians are doing a pretty good job of advocating for themselves. The volume of material on YouTube and Facebook and uh, national media and online media um, what difference does it make if the press officer from my corner of the UN says it's terrible what's happening in Syria? <coughs> what, 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 what value does that add? I think the, the journalists who get in, we can say normally there's, there's even a criticism that we're too tight with the journalists in other parts of the world. You know, you come on my plane and you write a nice story about my project and little Mohammed is having his lovely hot dinner and, and thanks very much and we'll all go and have a beer afterwards. Here, I can't help you at all. I can say maybe you should check out that school. But you, know, you being associated with me is, makes it your job even harder. The, the, the state of Syria feels that the humanitarian people need to be watched just as closely as the journalists, because they have, in their view, the potential to delegitimize and confuse and be instrumentalized by uh, hostile uh, forces. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was really illuminating. Thank mm. you very much indeed. And, and given that you haven't really talked to journalists very much, I think I saw you saw Lee's and me taking lots of notes. Yeah, yeah. Be, be, be nice, OK? Be nice. <laughs> We're all nice. <laughs> um, Hisham, ICRC, you also have some of the, the same issues, but not all of the same issues. Give us a little bit of your perspective. Well, I'd like to talk, first of all, about how people see this and how people are living this. <coughs> so it's very important from our perspective. Um, I think it's complementary to, to what you said, Ben, in a sense, because the way we work is very important to be in touch directly with people, but to also be in touch directly with the authorities and also with opposition groups. And that's very important if we want to get somewhere. You just said that in order to go to Homs or to any other place, we had to get in touch with a lot of people. From, no, I work with the International Committee of the Red Cross, but I'm also Lebanese, so uh, Syria is just my neighbor. And when I was a kid, my mom used to say, oh, let's go on a weekend to Damascus. And there's this very old market called Hamidi, which I love. It's the spices market and anything else there. And uh, weirdly enough, a few months ago, I was there, and you could still go to, to Hamidi. And um, basically what I felt is that it's somehow of a schizophrenic uh, place. We just spoke about that earlier, in the sense that some neighborhoods would be directly affected by the fighting. Uh, and then in another, I, rem I remember a colleague of mine was talking to me on the phone, and he said, I'm walking in, in one of Damascus' streets smelling the jasmine. And, and, and Damascus, for those who don't know, is very well known for the, the jasmine belts around the garden, which is something amazing. But in other streets and in other neighborhoods, it's a completely different reality within the same city. From our perspective, if, if I may just gradually say how the needs evolved. Uh, in the early stages, uh, more than a year ago, when we used to talk to people in Syria, mainly in Homs, in rural Damascus and other places, people used to say, but we don't need food. We don't need your help. We just need to feel for all of this to, to disappear. You know, this is Syria. This doesn't happen. Uh, 
So people didn't believe that this was happening. A few months later, this shifted, and it became uh, a matter of saying that, OK, now we need food. We need help. We need to, to doctors. We need medicines. Shyly, but people, halas, they realized that this is what they need now, and that maybe things are going to last longer, and they did, and they are. And, uh, and on another stage, which, uh, which is today, basically, if we, if we try to see a, an overall view of what, what the needs are, basically it's everything all together. With, with people who are inside uh, that need to feel safe, that lost a lot of people, a lot of relatives, uh, people that need medical care, and that's obviously priority number one now, with, with a lot of people being injured almost on a daily basis, not almost, on a daily basis. Uh, that's number one, and, and that's actually where the lack is happening. So uh, from our side, as, as International Committee of the Red Cross, if we have to choose which priority we have to, to go f to first, this is what we would do. But this is not what we are doing most. We are distributing food, a lot of it. Uh, we are giving, uh, making sure that there is clean water, and, and those things are obviously very important, especially, as you said, now with winter and the cold weather. I think um, a, a very good friend of mine uh, said something about Syria a few, few months ago. And to me, this, although I, I worked in, in many other contexts, uh, I can't compare between Libya last year and Syria today. It's, it's not possible for me to do so. But that friend said to me that the solution in Syria is not humanitarian, because the problem in, in the first place is not humanitarian. The problem is political. So what you guys are doing there is, I mean, don't you think that you guys are there to solve the problems? And it is true. We are not there to solve the problems. Humanitarian aid is just there to help people push the limit a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. But it's not going to be there forever. I mean, I, I worked in Rwanda where we, we assisted people for 13, 14 years. But then at some point, we're not there to substitute anyone. So this has to stop. So at the end of the day, I think that what's important to keep in mind in this regard is that people need to feel that they are safe. And they need to know that, OK, at least they could maybe not go back to what was before in their own lives. Because for a lot of them, it will not be uh, the same. But at least to know that there will be a, a new starting point. And again, humanitarian workers, us as International Committee of the Red Cross, will be there. We were there before. But we will not be the solution for the, for the problem in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me go now to Fadi Haddad, who from uh, the Mosaic Initiative. Yeah, Fadi. That's right. Thank you. Uh, firstly, forgive my English, because I've been in Syria three months now. It's enough for me to <laughs> forget my English. We'll honest. forgive your English, but we will ask you to speak a little more loudly. So the people yeah, in the back can hear speak. your bad English. Yeah, they also lost their voice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. um, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, uh, talk briefly about uh, the challenges we're facing uh, as the small Syrian, British Syrian NGOs working, let's say, in, in Britain to get aid uh, to uh, Syria. Um, first of all, the, the funding the aid uh, we're trying to uh, get the fund from normal people. We're not getting much aid from uh, big NGOs, uh, international government organizations. Uh, we formed uh, a, s a group of uh, humanitarian group for Syria, which uh, uh, sums up uh, the charities working uh, for uh, Syria in, in the UK. And that's uh, uh, a good start, let's say. Um, the second thing would be uh, getting this aid inside Syria. Uh, and uh, the, the it depends on the geographic of uh, the, the, the areas. You can get uh, now the medicine and food to, let's say, to Idlib, to uh, uh, some places in Homs, to uh, some places in Da'a, uh, from, let's say, Jordan, uh, Turkey, uh, Lebanon. But there is some places like uh, Damascus, suburb, I mean, it's, it's becoming like impossible to get it from, from the outside. You have to get it from inside. You have to buy it from inside. Until now, you, ha you can buy it uh, from 
inside Syria. I mean, I, I don't know until when. Uh, when I was there, it was at the beginning. It was okay to um, get some food in your car and try to do it voluntarily. Go some places and uh, give the food for the people in the shelters, um, in other places. But now it's it become impossible even to do to do so to to get even the food, medicine as well. Uh, it's it's harder to get the medicine inside inside Damascus. They are, I think they are now have been targeted more more than the Free Syrian Army. Um, they've uh, I mean if they know that there is um, a field hospital in a place, they will uh, it will be horrible. They they will try to shut it straight away. Um, and since like uh, ten days ago until now, they've. Uh, about 15 doctors in inside Damascus the small committee uh, when they find like one or two doctors they they search for the others and now it's th their policy have changed um, I, I worked with with two doctors one of them they took on Friday and they took him with his wife and his ch two years old child mm -hmm. just to push them I mean to not wait like there's like a policy of you, you don't speak before 48 hours so everybody knows yeah, they took you so they will try to hide but if they took you with your uh, wife and child I mean I think it's going to be shorter uh, s Monday they took another doctor uh, with his father and mother so um, it's it becoming more uh, stressful uh, more hard to 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 uh, keep out of uh, their reach um, and w when you're dealing with these these groups, you you you, you do like a good relation with the, with the, the the local community and civil society, and then afterwards um, you have th this this where the the journalists uh, have to help us. I mean, as they go inside, they know these committees, they know these uh, civil society people inside, so they they have to recommend them to other NGOs, so our mission is to work in partner uh, and to work uh, like a middle middle uh, agent between the outside NGOs and international uh, community with the people on the ground. And I mean, uh, we know them as I'm from Syria. I know, I know the people inside. I've, I've been there for a long time. I, 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 the people I've known before, I know how they work in. We we got we try to get like some photos, some more evidence. But I mean, we can't push it uh, too far for them because it it became more 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 hard to get more information, more proofs of what we are doing. That's the main the main challenge that we we we're facing. And um, I mean, we I think as 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 total what what we raised. Uh, for uh, these four NG uh, charities here, about one and a half million. Uh, it's not much, I mean, for a year and a half, for 24 million people in Syria. I mean, we are planning to double it uh, or triple it uh, now, not for the aim of uh, getting more profit, just to... Uh, m more people have been, like, uh, displaced, and as all of you know. And we need to get to all all of these uh, places. We're now uh, working on getting uh, lists of names uh, with every village uh, to the people who have been in need, who have uh, the father killed or the, 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 the brother, uh, who, who uh, get the food for the family. Now, we, these people can give us their names because I mean, it's fine with them, but other people, they're wanted. They, it's, it's really hard to get the, their, their names. But at least if we can get to all of these people who have uh, listed with us, I mean, uh, it'll be much better. I mean, my, my aim is, or our all the, the uh, charities, Syrian charities working, is to build really a good relation, a partnership with the, the international uh, organization, NGOs, Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll get better afterwards. Mm. Thank you very Thank much, you. Fadi. Um, before I open to the floor, um, 
it seems to be the time when important people are coming through London, because apart from Ben having to come through London, uh, Melissa Fleming is here. Melissa is the chief spokesperson for the UN High Commissioner for, for Refugees. And um, I didn't know she was coming, but she just appeared. So I think we should take advantage of her presence. So, Melissa, maybe you could just give us a little bit of, um, of your perspective on the situation of refugees and also this very fraught issue of, of how you are dealing with, with journalists. Because normally UNHCR is always out there trying to get us to come and get us to cover your activities and yeah, so on. So they yes. still are. <laughs> <laughs> they still are, but it depends on where. And I, if we had a, a lot of leases around the world as communicators, we wouldn't need to do our jobs anymore because I think you'll all agree the way she so evocatively spoke about the suffering of individual people would be enough to stir people into action. And I think what Ben said about um, three reasons to communicate. One is fundraising, the other is awareness raising. People need to know what is going on and to advocate, but what to advocate for. And yes, for one year, we also were under similar constraints. Inside Syria, UNHCR has 200 staff. Um, they were there to primarily serve the other refugees who were taking refuge inside uh, Syria, Iraqis. So ironically, the Iraqis are now fleeing back to Iraq. And the Syrians themselves, who have never been displaced, have never been refugees, are running away from their homes, mostly inside the country. We heard the figure that Lindsay um, said, 1.2 million people inside the country. Many have been displaced many times, living in public <coughs> buildings. Um, we're trying to reach them with a very difficult. If they cross international borders, and 300,000 have, at a rate right now of 3,000 a day, 3,000 a day, um, we will be reaching the number of 700,000 by the end of the year. But at least if they cross, they're safe. They're safe, but they're extremely traumatized, like the girl that is mentioned the 11 year old girl in Lebanon we hear story after story and we have to tell those stories better and we really appreciate journalists who will actually do that because we're very good at statistics <laughs> um, but these individuals these kids 50 percent of these refugees are children um, the other 25 percent are women and they've all lost family and they all have absolutely horrendous stories to tell and they're living in places like the Zatri camp which is inhospitable because of the landscape, not because we're not trying to make it the best place possible. But it would be like any one of you who is used to living in an apartment, having a high standard of living, and from one day to the next, having to pick up everything, probably having lost a lot, and run for your lives across a border and try to make a life for yourself in a tent, um, in a dusty place, uh, where you know you don't know what your future is going to be. You've lost your job. Um, you've lost parts of your family. It's it's a very very tragic situation. So, since I think you said from the ICRC and my boss, the High Commissioner for Refugees, always says this: we humanitarian agencies um, can can help you know heal the wounds, pick people's lives up um, once they've escaped. Um, but the solution is political. So what do we advocate for right now as communicators, as journalists, um, who Lise said we're on the side, we have to communicate on the side of the people. It is the people. The people need help um, and people need to be triggered into action to find a political so solution and until they do, uh, the world needs to help the people who are suffering and suffering is really, really bad. Thanks. Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, we've got about half an hour, um, so <coughs> let me open to questions. Those of you who have ever been to an event which I've chaired before know that I have a very limited tolerance for <laughs> ranting. <laughs> so no political <laughs> ranting from anybody. Questions? If you have experience in the region, please give us the benefit of that experience, but if you just have an opinion founded on your generalized sense of self, please <laughs> don't feel free to share it. 
Um, so with that, so <laughs> no I presume you're now. not a ranter. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask any questions now, are they? <laughs> right, um, let's take the microphone to the gentleman there, um, right at the end. If you could pass the microphone along. Thank you. Uh, James Denslow, Crisis Action. I could ask two questions, one to the humanitarians on the panel and one to the journalists. Um, ben, you seem to be saying that the metrics of access have been getting better since February, although very small steps going forward. And you mentioned also unusual actors, like I can't remember the name, Islamic Forum was useful as a kind of neutral arbiter that seemed to allow the regime more confidence. I wondered whether there's any other, other ideas of unusual suspects you think who could be useful, useful third party players that could help improve access going forward, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, other ideas from other civil society you haven't thought of. Uh, question for the, the two journalists. I, I wondered, and I take advantage of you on the panel, to sort of see what you think about Robert Fisk's embedding with this Syrian military, which has been come under a lot of criticism. Do you think that uh, it's a case of good journalism and a good way of reporting the conflict? Thank you. Okay, let me. Um different ways of access, Ben. Do you have any <coughs> thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the big question on ways of access is one that's very delicate for the UN. It's about going through the window rather than the door. <laughs> and uh, uh, as the UN is a, is a club of member states, going through the window in the past in Sudan and in other countries has involved the permission of the, of the capital involved. So that one uh, we know from the media, we know from our own contacts that there's a lot of... Uh, genuine uh, uh, and very valuable humanitarian work going through, through the window. Uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is the second largest multilateral organization in the world. They see themselves as potentially a, a kind of com almost a competitor to the UN. They're interested in operating in the humanitarian space. And we were, we were going quite well with that. We did say, why don't we have some Indonesian NGOs, Malaysian NGOs. The Malaysians are in Jordan last week trying to figure out if they could get permission. The trouble is then the OIC, uh, the head of the OIC is Turkish and is headquartered in Jeddah. And uh, <laughs> Syria's membership was suspended in, uh, in late August. So uh, that, uh, that isn't going so well. The League of Arab States was already uh, problematic. Um, in terms of finding another uh, group. I mean, the UN is uh, unfortunately uh, extraordinarily relevant in Syria because it's the last kind of multilateral institution that um, is tolerated, mm -hmm. uh, if I may be so blunt. Yeah. Mm. So there really isn't any other international body other than the UN that you can see at this point could... Well, the, could I mean, the ICRC, uh, yeah, the in ICRC, partnership with the Federation yeah. of the Red Cross and Red Crescent societies and yes. the, the National Red Crescent is continually trying yeah. to negotiate. I mean, I shouldn't speak on, on their behalf, but yeah. um, it's the UN, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, national efforts, which are huge and, and, and extraordinarily robust. But in terms of new international actors, no, we're, we're, we've tried. I was looking for a Cuban NGO, Venezuelan NGO, the Russians and the Chinese. What about Malaysians? Malaysians, there's some good Malaysians. Malaysians are good, but the no new international NGO from any country has got permission to operate right. this, this year. Some of them have changed their work, but no new ones. Okay. Um, on the other question, uh, um, as chair and as um, myself, I have um, a basic principle, which is to never say anything about Robert Fisk. <laughs> in public. Please, do you have a similar? Well, actually, we agree on that. Because um, I think you asked two things. One is you asked about embedding, and then you asked about Robert Fisk embedding. Robert Fisk, as everyone knows, is a big voice on the Middle East, a very strong voice on the Middle East. And when you're a strong voice on the Middle East, you can sometimes be controversial. If I separate the two, um, I think absolutely uh, people should be embedding with the Syrian military because we're going, a lot of journalists are going in with the rebels and war sadly has, it, the Syrian war has more than two sides. It has three, four, five, every month goes by. It, the, the war takes uh, much more violent and, and, and deadly shapes and that's the big problem now in Syria. You just don't know who's, who's actually firing the guns anymore. So yes, I believe that um, journalists should, when it's safe enough, you should go in with the, with the military. I'm going to take advantage of having a microphone now yes, and say, um, I, I'd like to hear from Lindsay. No, because, no, because <laughs> Lindsay has actually, Lindsay and I fought over who should be the chair. And I said, no, you be the chair. So no, you be the chair. And I said, well, if you're the chair, you can't give your points of view. <laughs> Lindsay has spent a lifetime uh, writing about all the issues, of course, that matter, but a lot about humanitarian issues. And many of you will remember her work in Africa. And I want, and you've been very robust 
on the relationship between journalists and the aid community. You gave a hint of it at the beginning. Mm. Do you want to make some reflections? I know we met in Lebanon. Um, you went there to, to see the what was happening outside. But do you have any strong views about how journalists are covering it, the relationship with the aid community, in light of this absolutely horrific conflict? Well, uh, thank you, Liz. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I think it's really difficult. I mean, I've always been very, um, you know, for ha I mean, it's confession time. I was an aid worker before I was a journalist. Um, and so then it, it's like being a reformed smoker. You know, I really, really hate people who smoke. And so, <laughs> so I've always tended to say, you know, the humanitarian lens is not the one to look at the world through. And I used to get very pissed off about it in Africa because, you know, you'd get lost journalists and you bugger all about whatever country um, going out there and with an aid agency and thinking it was all about aid, whereas actually aid is such a minor part of what goes on. But in Syria, it's all different. And I was very interested in what you were saying, because uh, to some extent, I think at this point, we, we all know the truth, which is that there is a desperate need for humanitarian aid in Syria. But humanitarian aid is not the answer, because that wasn't the question in the beginning. And so... Um, I, as a journalist, I, I actually have um, an uncharacteristic concern about not jeopardizing any aid effort and being actually quite worried about, um, as a journalist, what I might report or my colleagues might report, which might um, uh, give away information which would be detrimental. I mean, you talked about field hospitals and, and so on. The last thing, I mean, I want to tell the story of field hospitals and what's happening. It's an amazing story, you know. Um, but the last thing I would want to do would be to endanger any of that kind of work. And I don't really care if we're talking about field hospitals on which side or whose side or what the hell. I'm just talking about you know the extraordinary suffering we see so uh, from my point of view there's a there's a way in which we can work together much more in this than maybe i would be comfortable with normally but at the same time i totally respect ben's point of view because he's trying to get something done on on through the medium of the government which is where they have to have to work as the un um and it's not necessarily you know, helpful to be attached to journalists, not really helpful either way. Thank you, Liz, that's enough from me. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yes, lady at the front here. The microphone's coming. Hello, I'm Nicole Pichet from the Parliamentary Human Rights Group. I have two quick questions. Um, given that, as humanitarian agencies, you're dependent, particularly in this conflict, on the government for access to, to Syria and parts of Syria. I'm just wondering what you can do practically to ensure that aid is given as impartially as possible. And that's not just food distribution, but access to health facilities, which I hear are a very big problem. And second, what do you do when you hear testimony from people that you're helping from victims about serious and systematic human rights abuses? Do you just have to shut down and say, sorry, can't, can't listen to that, and direct people somewhere else? Or are you able to sort of quietly file that away and... Mm -hmm. and this is this, this conversation is on the record, so this is this is being streamed and anybody can hear it. I'm going to put that both to, to ICRC first, <laughs> and then. Better to leave now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, okay, is that the time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first to ICRC and then to Ben. Yeah. It's not only uh, related to authorization by the government. It's also largely related to agreements with the uh, opposition groups. And that's something very important to keep in mind. For, for instance, on several occasions, whenever we wanted to take Baba Amr, the mm. famous Homs neighborhood, that uh, we always negotiate with both. Uh, and if there is no green light from both to the ceasefire, then we will not go in. And it will not go in. Uh, on, on the other uh, aspect and, and documentation with uh, of violations uh, on the side uh, on any side, from our part as ICRC, we definitely take all of this into consideration. Now, I don't know how many of you heard the ICRC say it's confidential. Yeah, all the bloody we time. say mm -hmm. that we say that a lot. But in the case of Syria, surprisingly, you you were saying that. This is the, the least you've communicated uh, uh, on Syria. This is the most we've ever communicated mm. as ICRC. Mm. And on, on the issue of violations, however, this is something that we do take into consideration. 
but that we tackle directly and bilaterally with all involved. And that is something crucial for our work, direct contact. Now, a lot of you might say, but why, what is this leading to? You might be surprised, but on the other hand, for us, it <coughs> remains very important to document this and to talk and to remind parties of, of a conflict of their obligation. It does not stop there. But let, let, I'm going to stop here. And but now can I just ask you one question before we pass the um, Prison visiting, there are detainees on both yeah. sides, both rebels and government yeah. are, are holding people. Have you as ICRC been able to have access on either side to detainees? We have uh, uh, an agreement in principle with the Syrian authorities to visit all places of detention under the Ministry of Interior, but we would like to visit all places of detention and all persons detained in Syria. So that goes obviously beyond uh, the Minister of Interior. So far we visited the, Syri the Damascus Central Prison and the Aleppo Central Prison. On the side of the opposition, this is a dialogue that we're also uh, carrying out. And, and we are obviously uh, interested. Again, we, we try to deal with everyone in this case. OK, Ben. Mm -hmm. OK, on um, impartiality, we are limited in the number of partners we can work through. We are limited in how many feet we can have on the ground by permission, also by uh, safety issues. Um, we, uh, we do have monitoring teams that go out, especially to look at the food, which is now 1.5 million people a month. We have uh, teams moving around, um, checking what happened during the distribution, <laughs> afterwards picking up the complaints, and so on. We are increasingly getting data from the Red Crescent and the charities. Um, in Homs, for example, about 13 charities and the Red Crescent have put their data together. We have a map of exactly where their registered people are, and you can see there are plenty of registered people in opposition-held areas. There are some areas which are besieged and are not getting anything, definitely, in Halidi, Hamidi, and Homs, also down in Qusair, uh, towards the Lebanese border. So we, we don't claim that uh, the, the channels that we have reach everybody in the country. We're under severe and repetitive pressure from the British government and other major donors to sort of somehow prove that we're reaching everybody. And we, we try and uh, kick back a little bit and say, well, hang on, the people in the, the women and children in government held homes. Are you concerned to help them? Are you concerned about their political views? Are you concerned about the military activities of their menfolk? What, what is the issue here? Mm. The people who live in the area controlled by X may support Y. And um, there's some parts of the country, I think, from the government side, from the door, not the window. We don't claim really to get deep into Idlib uh, from the government side. We're probably not getting deep enough into northern Aleppo uh, and down uh, in, in some parts of Deir Ezzur. But uh, on the whole, com compared to other humanitarian operations in the world, you know, the level of access is acceptable, the monitoring is acceptable, it's by no means textbook, it's by no means perfect. The SARC, the Red Crescent, branches vary tremendously in their uh, quality and, and their uh, ability to reach. So uh, on balance, we feel it's an operation which meets appropriate humanitarian standards given the circumstances. Do you, is there an, um, an issue? Do you, do you look at it and think, well, um, people like Fadi are getting stuff in on the other side. And so I'm not saying that you wouldn't worry about the other side, but you're aware of that. So it sort of balances out. Is that yeah. fair or is that wrong? I don't think uh, we, we as the UN don't know enough. And we, those who are doing it, uh, what is the motivation for them to pool and share their information? Mm. It's not necessarily at the moment a net gain to say, all right, I'll do this and you do that, even amongst the agencies who are operating cross-border in an unofficial mm. manner. Mm. So we are interested if, if they uh, could coordinate themselves and maybe we have a, a picture, you know, where the, where, uh, where the mm. biggest gaps are. But it's not at the moment something the UN would, would lead because it would jeopardize everything on the door side. And, is it, and are you worried, is it a worry, that people operating on that side are basically pro-rebel? Is that a danger? Or I don't a think problem? I would. I, uh, you, listen, if you're mixing the bullets and the diapers, yes, it's a problem, because it undermines what the message I've been trying to yeah. put forward to our interlocutors on the other side, that when we say we're here for diapers, we're here for diapers. Yeah. 
Now, if the mixed cargo on the other side is undermining, then it's undermining to the concept of humanitarian being a protected space, uh, people who work in it having a mm. particular uh, uh, demand under international humanitarian law for their safety and so on. Fadi, would you, would you like to say something about that? Because, it's, because you're, an, yeah. you're a new, you're a young organization, you're a Syrian organization, and I would say you're a politically committed organization. Tell me if I'm, I'm, whereas these two are representing big international organizations, yeah. it's slightly different. So, so tell me where you come from on what that. What we're trying to do here is, uh, our small organizations is not related to any political views. And that's what we're trying to push with the civil society and with the international uh, committees. The, the, the issue is other people can get um, support from, uh, let's say, uh, the Gulf area, but they have their agendas, they have mm -hmm. their, their money. I mean, they, they, they can be, the people can be related when we spoke with them and we can give you this and that. Okay, but I mean, I mean, when, how? I mean, it's, it's taken ages. We've done like a, an event, we, we raised, let's say 50,000 pounds. We, we, we got it after, I mean, through the banks and everything, through after three, three months to get it there. And then we, we bought the, the medical equipment from Turkey and we, we get it inside, I mean, the people will be like, I mean, we can get it from Saudi Arabia after, after one week, we can get what we need. I mean, we, I mean, we, we need to, to, to be more working on, on this matter, especially to, to work with, with the people on the ground, with the committees, um, to, to make them feel that it's not about politics. You don't have to be related mm -hmm. to us. I mean, we, we, we're just doing it for, for our people. I mean. so, so to clarify, uh, you, you then wouldn't get the stuff from Saudi Arabia because you feel that that becomes politicized? We don't want them. I mean, of course, of course, we don't want to take it from uh, other, other people. If, if they want us to be under their, um, what, what they think uh, and what they want us mm. to, to, mm -hmm. to, to be related to. I mean, especially last, um, uh, Field hospital mm. in 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 the have been hit in in one place. I can't say where, which yeah, sure. which area. Uh, they told us. He told me. I've been uh, contacted by uh, a group uh, from Saudi Arabia, and they told us they will give us salaries to the doctors. We don't want the salaries, but the main issue: if you can help us build it, uh, mm. we we. I mean, each bank transfer. I mean, takes like ages to go there, and they stopped the last payment for this field hospital we're, we're getting it through uh, Jordan for the medical stuff and and now uh, they, they got the doctor we have to to do another channel to, to get it there I mean the people are uh, aware of of uh, the intentions of other uh, other uh, countries or other political views but, and they want to work with us if we are willing to work I mean and help mm. them so um, um, hopefully, if we can if we can work closer to, to, to with other with uh, other organisations, we'll, we'll be happy. And on the on the other point, I mean, I even the Red Crescent, they they're working on the ground. I've been there, like the last hit in in uh, let's say in uh, in uh, August uh, to Khutsaya uh, suburbs of uh, of Damascus. Um, some some displaced uh, people. They they've been in in the the uh, schools, and they got. The, the aid from the Red Crescent, piles of it. We can see the boxes. We, we, we went there, we have the stuff in the car. We saw the boxes, we left. I mean, they have like more than they need. And it, it's under control of the Syrian, Syrian government. Mm. They, they have their own people. On the other side, they want to separate them. Uh, maybe uh, families together, the men want them to, to lock them in, in, in another school. Yeah. Most of the people, they don't want to be in the schools, and now they are taking them out. Um, and, and you have to, to give, I mean, the, the, the bigger amount of people are displaced outside the... the, the beyond the government control. Yeah, be, yeah, beyond the government. They don't want to be under, under their control. Okay, fine. Let's take a few more questions. Um, lady here with the dark hair and the black. No question. I can just share my experience. I came back from Syria yesterday. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, I first was approached by the diaspora community um, in Yorkshire, and um, there's a group of doctors, hand in hand for Syria, the local charity, um, Syria Relief, and they said that they were tired, really, really tired, and wanted to reach out to the. I've met you, Ben, in Nairobi. Um, 
and um, yeah, they were just they came to see me and said that they wanted to reach out to the wider Muslim community, the Pakistani community, Asian, and they felt I'm Andrew Tay Kelly, by the way, from Basic Human Rights and the founder and trustee. And and how could we do that? The I always believe that um, unless I don't see it myself, unless I don't feel the pain, I can't stand up and appeal for anything. I'm a mother of four children, so when they came to see me, I thought, okay, I was in Libya the year before, because I wanted to go and see it for myself and come back. Um, and so Syria was going to be a real struggle, an argument with my children, but I went in through Lebanon and into Homs, because I wanted to see the unofficial humanitarian corridor and why the international community, yes, all the calls and the big charities, and I won't name, the local charities within Syria were saying, well, we keep going to them and we're not getting the money. We need the money to deliver the aid. So, okay. And that's what I did. I went to the field hospitals. There was continuous shelling. And at least what you were saying, you've got to humanise it. And, um, and I'm sorry if I, you know, I get really, um, having children and everything, I get really upset about the whole thing. And I try, as a humanitarian, to sort of distance myself from it. But it's very difficult. Um, but I went in and I saw that in Alcacer how difficult it was. Uh, 100,000 people, I was told, were there. And um, I think something like 7,000 were left. I stayed with a family, fantastic doctor that's running that, that hospital. Um, and came back and we raised a lot of awareness through uh, in <coughs> Ramadan with community events. And as you were saying as well, we raised that money. Um, in the first 12 minutes, we raised £60,000. We only got 30, but we managed to deliver that aid um, in Alcacer on Eid Day um, and food parcels. And what I wanted to demonstrate, what we wanted to demonstrate is that through local partners and giving them the capacity by building and putting in monitoring and evaluation that they can do it. And conflict and everything around, and I agree with you, you know, people not giving their names, etc. And it's really, really difficult, but there is a way around this to get that aid in. Um, and then I went to observe the Turkish side of it, which is where I've been, and I went to Atmir. They call it the no-name camp. And um, when I first approached it, I thought, well, there isn't this sea of tents, as, you, as I saw in Peshenville. Um, there doesn't seem to be anybody here. And I turned to Dr. M, and I said, there's not many people here. He said, no, there's 3,000 people here. There were 6,000 the other day. But as we started driving through the olive groves, and the person who owns the olive groves doesn't want waste management in place because he wants everybody to leave and go, and if he thinks that the waste management people will come in or anybody will help, nobody will leave. Um, and there was just sea of people. And it's not a class differentiation. You know, well, people who lived very well, um, there was one family, um, seven children, and little girl, um, Harab, have, was very badly scarred, two years old, I think. And I immediately thought, oh, right, okay, this is a story that I need to go back home and tell because it's shrapnel, you know. And they said, no, it's not, uh, the house was bombed, they've lost everything, but mum was cooking and the, the pan fell on her and burnt her. Um, it's hot, um, so many things that they need. Organised in the sense that the medical supplies were very orderly, orderly put. And I, I kept asking Dr. M, who's running this camp? Who's doing the camp management? Um, and he said, well, you know, some of the Saudi donors are paying somebody else and we just come along and it, we do what we can. And we cook the food, they get breakfast and they get the evening meal. And I thought, oh, that's not sphere standards. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to allow them to do it themselves. And I, and I said, well, what about NFIs? He said, what? Um, he said, they get what's given. And they, so I spoke to quite a few people. And they, when, I, when I first went in through Lebanon, there was hope. People were hoping. I felt so despondent. I felt ashamed. I couldn't give them hope. It wasn't going to be a year like everybody was saying. They're now talking three and four years. And then I managed to go on. And I went to see um, the family in Atmir, the host community, and how they were living. 
and Bria and her, her five children and daughter Mohammed overstretched host community coming to their home. They're from Aleppo. I'm going to ask you to, to, to yeah. wrap up. Yeah, just give I'm us a ranting. Little bit more. It's, it's, it's all right. right. Just give us a little bit more. It's okay. And what they need then is Ocha. <laughs> <laughs> they need Ocha. They really do. And the meetings that we had and some of the charities, the neutrality of the humanitarian community is the issue. But, but, the, but these people are refugees. Right? IDPs, right? Because no, they're IDP. inside Syria. And they're still within Syria. Okay. They're in Syria. And in the evening, I observed the Turkish authorities coming along with the big vans and people just hoping mm -hmm. if their name was going to be plucked out. And that's what those that are on the border are waiting for. But really quickly, what they need, Ocha, really do, the coordination. Uh, IMC was there, the meetings and other organizations, and NGOs saying, don't repeat my name, I shouldn't be here. And yeah. I said, right, fine, right. But there's no coordination, duplicity. The local Syrian NGOs are fantastic, the fact that they don't have the capacity. They know what they're doing. Yes, they're very proud. They don't want a sea of, <coughs> of, of the international community going in, but they are aware that the need is there for capacity building. But thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, yes, gentlemen over here. Yeah, um, I think Ben was talking about uh, you know the reality on the ground. Do you want uh, to tell us your name? Sorry, my name is uh, Samir Mahmood, and I practice as a barrister. Oh yes. In London, I'm from Pakistan myself. Yes. Um, I just uh, uh, I think Ben was saying something about the reality on the ground sometimes requiring uh, well, if I can put words in his mouth, almost appeasing the the Syrian regime or or, or at least deferring to it. Yes. And I wonder what each of the panel think about the elephant in the room seems to be. Uh, the lack of political influence. We haven't really talked about ab about that, uh, and and what what each of you think of the ro the role of the U.S. and if you have any criticism or or, or or observations on the role of the U.S. Okay. Yes. I mean, we should be aware that y it is aid agencies, particularly UN, ICRC, tend to be quite careful about criticizing a the people Very who give careful. them money, <laughs> and b um, you know. The, the people through whom they have to work. So I, I'm giving yes, them a slight a bit of a... Yes, but equally, what, what's been said is that we're not, we, we, we can't just deal with treating the, the violations. Yes. We need the violations to stop. We need the violations. Okay. Lise, can I ask you, get you onto that one? <laughs> Why am I always the guinea pig? You know? <laughs> because you're the journalist <laughs> and you can cope with um, anything. I'm not sure what you meant when you said, especially the role of the US. What, what were you hinting at? Or In terms of any political influence or their reaction to or lack of to what's happening. From, from how you see it. S Syria is hard. Every single person I've spoken to, whether it's uh, Laktab Rahimi, Kofi Annan, King Abdullah of Jordan, or you know, children in the refugee camps, nobody, nobody has an answer for this crisis. The only answer lies in the people in the Syrian government at the very top who are calling the shots, literally and the many commanders of the many rebel groups who sadly don't have a unified command. They're in, and it's not just Holmes commander, it's neighborhood by neighborhood. Until they come to the decision, what is it they call it, they came up in Northern Ireland, the mutual hurting uh, stalemate. Until they decide to end this conflict, sadly the conflict is not going to end. And no matter how much the United States gets to get, wants to get involved, and sadly they don't want to get involved, because the conundrum is that they're thinking, well, if we send in more weapons, will that cause more harm than good? And you may criticize that, and more and more people are criticizing it, saying you could end it more quickly. But there are real concerns about the situation in Syria, and everyone says Syria is different because you know, people use this example that Libya, you know, Libya will have problems, but there'll be a Libyan problem. When Syria has problems, it's a problem for Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, it affects the whole neighborhood, if you like. That doesn't excuse the United States, which comes under a lot of criticism, particularly from the rebels and the activists who say you should be more involved. Um, again, our job is just to, to write about it, but I think it is, it is a very difficult uh, conflict, and I don't, I don't really know what, what the answer is, but I really wish the people at the top would understand that at the end of the day, they will have to come to the table, and I hope that once they do, all of Syria won't be gone. Ben, appeasing the government, what's your answer <laughs> on that one? Well, I, I couldn't possibly uh, be the one to, to judge that, but we would work with anybody who controls the space in which civilians need help, whether it's uh, uh, 
from whichever faction in any country in the world, we deal with the controlling authority. I'm not sure I've got the terminology right in the international humanitarian law. Frankly, we'll deal with anybody. Now, appeasing implies that they're getting something. They're not getting anything from my blankets. They're not. In fact, you would imagine there's a political advantage to allowing the blankets to reach the people so that they're less unhappy. So uh, uh, we deal with anybody, and uh, we make no apology for that. Um, I think it's, uh, as I say, the question is a valid question. Can we monitor it properly? At the moment, we feel it's good enough. It's not great, but it's satisfactory, the level of monitoring we can do, and we can report back to the taxpayer who bought the blanket, where it went, and, and how it got there. You want to say anything on that one, Shem? Well, I think you said it all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. No, I mean, uh, f from our side, it's it's uh, it's basically uh, the same. It's not a matter of appeasing. And as you said, uh, logically, you'd think that uh, if if you are allowed to go there and help people, people would be, you know, at ease, and, and it wouldn't be such a fuss. But at the at the end of the day, uh, it's not that. What what is at play? What is at play is that people still need. And today it's even much, much bigger than before uh, on a daily basis, and they are still not getting what they need. I mean, let me give you a figure. I was so happy about a, one, a month ago when my colleagues told me we helped a million people with food. It's almost, I'm not going to say nothing, but it's definitely by far not reaching a fraction of the needs in Syria. It's nothing. And the constraint is access. The constraint isn't money. From our side, money is not an issue yeah. today. From our side, what, what is an issue is being able to deliver. Buying the, uh, using the money to buy assistance is not a problem, but to make it reach all areas is, is a problem. Still. And that problem is caused by just the government or by <coughs> rebels as well, or by no. the fact of the fighting? Let me put it in another way. Whenever we try to go somewhere, and th I think it, it's been a many, many months that we never had an issue of one or the other saying, don't go. Mm -hmm. Government says go, and the opposition says come, and you know, vice versa. But then and at some point when we tried to go to certain areas, the fighting resumed. We, we launched at some point, we said that we are not in favor of a humanitarian corridor because it involves boots on the ground and a whole political issue and blurring the line between humanitarian action and, and, and military intervention. But at the same time, we called for a humanitarian pause and fighting whenever it was needed. It worked once. It did work for two days, two hours every day. We asked for it twice again, and it didn't work, although both said yes, no problem. Whenever we tried to go in, the fighting resumed again. So there is a necessity today to make sure, according to international, international law, yes, but according to logic as well, that aid must reach people who need it. Before we I'll come back to a couple of questions, but Ben, can I ask you one more thing, which is about the buffer zone? Because there's increasing talk um, again now about a buffer zone, probably on the Jordanian border, because it was reported in the New York Times the other day that there are American military officers in Jordan, um, and they're looking at the refugee situation and they're worried about the destabilization of Jordan and so on, and then there's talk about a, a, a buffer zone. Do you see that as a, as a goer or not? It's the same as a corridor. Yeah. If it's inside Syria, yeah. a buffer zone backed by a foreign power is a, basically an intervention. As I said before, we will deal who, with whoever controls the territory. At the moment, the position of the UN is that those corridors don't seem to add up in terms of being a, a, either politically feasible or providing safety uh, and protection to civilians. So. Okay, right, we should be ending, but let me take, there's a few questions, so let me, let me take, there's three there, so let me take all three and then we'll come to for a last word um, for the panel, so one, two, three. Yes, lady there. Hi, I'm Sarah Bradley from the Asfari Foundation. Um, I just wondered if you could com comment on the um, humanitarian impact, if, if there is one, of international sanctions on Syria. Impact of sanctions, that's the first question. Uh, yeah. Mark Lebel from the BBC. Just to take the question from over there up a notch, um, over a year ago I was talking to a political aide to the British Armed Forces and seeing how foreign military action 
whether it be possible, whether it was a scenario they were imagining and comparing it to Libya, they said that it was completely different because of the geography, because of the spread of the rebels. It was a very difficult thing to even imagine then. Ben was talking about humanitarian work as a Trojan horse, uh, suspicions that some of what you find might be passed on to other people. It, not in that sense, but in the sense that this overall picture that you're drawing of a worsening situation we heard there from someone who just came back from Syria, maybe three or four years to go in this, um, certainly it's going to add to a question? case for military, foreign military action. I was wondering from the panel how likely they think that might be and also what effect it would have. How likely military intervention would be and, and the effect, uh, uh, impact. Okay, that's a bit, okay, good. And Hi. the next um, person. Yasin Fatin, medical student. Um, so you touched on, from an aid perspective, you touched on how sometimes government interferes in your work. Um, as a journalist, um, I know you say the BBC is impartial and everything, but have you experienced similar pressures? Intervention, uh, yeah. Okay, interview. I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from this end, starting with Fadi, and move around, ending with Ben, and you can take any, any or all of those questions. The impact of sanctions, if you've observed that, what do you think the likely impact of military intervention would be? You're not a journalist, so I don't have to ask you the journalist question. That one was for Lee's. <laughs> or you. Yeah, I mean... On the buffer zone, I mean, uh, yes, if, please we can do. Do, if we can do uh, uh, a buffer zone, that will make our life easier to get the, the wounded people. I mean, instead of mm. doing the field hospital inside, we can do it in the buffer zone. We can just get them to the buffer zone. That will be, that will uh, ease it with three days for, mm -hmm. for the people to get them outside, either to Turkey or to, to Jordan. That will be, I mean, the best thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please, um, interference from the government in your, your reporting. Tell us, tell us your experience. Um, it's not easy to work in Syria, but it's never been easy to work in Syria. It's never been a place where uh, people feel they can freely express their political opinions. This has been the way for as long as I've been going to Syria, which is more than 20 years. Now it's particularly difficult. People are afraid because the eyes and the ears of the government are everywhere. Their intelligence agencies are everywhere. As journalists, we travel with government monitors, uh, and there's often uh, ununiformed agents around, uh, not just watching us, but watching the Syrians. And what we do in our reporting, you know, my approach to it is we tell our viewers, our listeners, exactly what's happening. So we say when there are, we can't show you their pictures, but the troops are just off camera. Or there's intelligence people here, so the person is afraid to speak. And I think that's the best way, and our people are not stupid. They know exactly what kind of a context that we're working in. They, you know, it's, it's the same situation as, as Ben was talking about, although it does sound that you're under even greater pressures than us. But uh, in a country which has been under such control for a long time, people are very unwilling to relinquish control. So they want to keep an eye on everything. So you're, everything you do, you are, are being monitored. Uh, and I think you just have to have the courage of your conviction and do the best job that you can and tell it as you see it. Thank you very much. Um, Hisham, tell us a bit about um, impact of sanctions and likely impact of military intervention. Yeah, I mean, uh, ever since this crisis started, uh, there has been obviously an impact for, for sanctions that was not really felt uh, largely at the beginning. A lot of people used to say it, uh, businessmen uh, and, and Syrians are businessmen. They live from business, so it's, uh, small shops or big businesses and hotels. Uh, and the situation obviously is more and more affected by that. But today is mostly, it's mostly the, uh, the violence, it's mostly the fighting, is the fact that they cannot get what they need. We are buying food in the local market in Syria. The International Committee of the Red Cross is buying that locally. We're not buying the medicines there. Once we feel that the market is going to be really under uh, uh, stress, we're not going to do that anymore. But so far, we are able to do it. And what about the um, likely impact of military intervention? Is that well, I mean, are uh, you preparing for that? Is that something you think about in your contingency planning? W basically, it's impossible today for us to speculate about any scenario. I myself stopped doing that a, w a while ago mm. when I saw all what happened uh, across the region. But obviously, if 
military intervention happens, you'd have to assume there, there will be fighting. The main thing that should be kept in mind, and this is where we will be staying to remind parties of the conflict of, is that there are rules to follow, and that's it. Ben, the impact of sanctions and the likely impact of military intervention. Um, the impact of sanctions is, uh, okay, there are no UN sanctions. There are EU sanctions, there are American sanctions. Uh, there are a lot of other countries in the world that are still trading and banking with Syria, so the sanctions is not a very heavy uh, regime compared to some other countries that have experienced them. It, it tremendously affects purchasing from overseas because of the bank. If you can't bank through the, the U.S., you, you find it very difficult to do business. Um, a, a range of products are untouched by the European sanctions. Um, including medicine and, and, other, and other foodstuffs. I think the point is, is that it's bound to have an inflationary impact in one way or another because the cost of doing business becomes more complicated. Uh, it's part of an overall economic decline that is quite scary when you put all the pieces together. It involves the fact that agriculture exports is dead. Uh, the migrant labor for agriculture can't move around the country as they did. Tourism is dead the fertilizer, seed, irrigation, and all these other agricultural inputs, which were very much state-run, they are now uh, uh, unsure. The supply of fuel, which in, in an agricultural system which is 65% irrigated, the next agricultural season is, could be uh, uh, pretty uh, disastrous. So I think the sanctions is having an impact. It's affecting the ability, but there's very little evidence yet uh, that I've read that w it puts it together in a, in a cohesive way. Um, and uh, it's a very sensitive issue, obviously, for the Americans and Europeans on, uh, on, on the social impact, and the studies are not conclusive at the moment. Likely impact of, of military intervention. Not my is shop. That, not yeah, my and shop. it's not a thing that you don't, you're not doing contingency planning for that? We contingency plan, and the events keep catching up with our contingency plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you all very much for, for coming here this evening. I have certainly learned a lot from the, the panel. I hope you have too, so let us thank them very much. <laughs>